It's a regional water quality impairment assessment. This is going to be a presentation by John Cassani, Calusa Waterkeeper, my previous uh, boss, I say. <laughs> and that's the reason why I'm a little nervous here. Maybe I think I should relax a little bit. But I've no, never I'm known you to be nervous. <laughs> keeping an eye on what I'm doing here. So, okay. So the purpose of this is to provide a review of the regional impairment assessment by the Calusa Waterkeepers issued last March. The report summarized water quality impairments in nine counties using FDEP assessment criteria. This relates to the water quality improvement priority area. So without any further ado, John Cassani with the Calusa Water Keepers. Uh, thanks, Ernesto, and, and thanks, Nicole and Jennifer, for the invitation to share a few thoughts about water quality in the region. Always happy to do that. Okay, next slide. And, and just by way of introduction, um, Clusa Waterkeeper is a licensed member of the Waterkeeper Alliance, uh, which is a, an international organization at this point in time. Uh, there are, I believe, 14 waterkeepers in Florida, and uh, we are one of those, one of the newer ones starting in 2016. Uh, next slide. And so this was kind of our project area uh, when the application was made to the Alliance. So it includes Lake Okeechobee, Cusatchee River, and uh, Greater Charlotte Harbor uh, north to about the Lee County line. Uh, so about a thousand square miles of just water in our project area, uh, but it is more or less one uh, homogeneous hydrologic um, system, if you will. Next slide. So today, I just wanted to talk a, a little bit uh, about the chronology of our concern about impairments occurring in regional waters. Uh, and we'll give a little summary of our uh, water quality impairment report that we uh, produced in March of this year uh, for the nine county Southwest Florida uh, region. And then maybe spend just a minute or two talking about uh, some suggestions for potential corrective action. Uh, where water quality is declined or uh, determined to be verified impaired. Next slide. So kind, kind of the chronology uh, for me was that I've worked in advocacy, water quality advocacy for quite some time in Southwest Florida. Um, and we were part of, or I was part of some of the uh, stakeholder group that had the Estero, uh, I'm sorry, yes, the Estero Bay tributaries designated as outstanding Florida waters. As you're probably aware, OFW is um, representing a really special uh, water category, a high value water category in Florida, uh, as, as codified by state statute. And these types of waters, OFWs, are entitled to the most protection that the state can provide. Um, so we were very concerned by about the mid 2000s, uh, we we're beginning to see almost all the tributaries, the OFW tributaries to uh, Estero Bay were verified and paired for one uh, pollutant parameter or another. And then in 2015, Matt Lache was verified and paired for nutrients. And so that was a, a considerable concern to us. And so I came to the TAC in, uh, I think it was April of 2017 and asked to make a presentation, uh, trying to bring some emphasis to a restoration process uh, for these growing number of impaired waterways in, in the region. And then uh, as, a, as a result of that um, presentation and uh, subsequent deliberation by the committee and, and CHNEP staff, uh, a letter was issued to uh, FDEP uh, doing two things. One, petitioning for a TMDL development uh, for a number of the OFWs in the study area. When I came to the TAC in 2017, I thought, you know, Matt Lachey Pass and the Estero Bay tributaries were the only OFWs uh, that were experiencing impairment. But other members of the TAC said, no, no, we've got a considerable OFW WIBIDs in our project area, and many of these are already impaired. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so this was the letter that went out October of 2017, signed by uh, your executive director, Jennifer. Uh, next slide. And, at, you know, basically emphasizing all the things that are codified in the CHNEP Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan, 
uh, looking at reasonable assurance plans, basin management action plans, nutrient reduction plans, pretty much goes without saying, all things that the CHNEP has been involved with in the context of, of restoration. And I, I would add that restoration has been a significant component of our mission statement at Calusa Waterkeeper as well. Um, and, and so part of the letter was uh, indicating a priority action is to reduce non-point source pollutants, which we maps do, and uh, emphasizing cleanup plans to remediate them. This is all part of the suite of uh, factors leading to restoration. Next slide. So part of what staff had done uh, in that, during that process in that chronological sequence was they surveyed all the WIBIDs in the CHMEP study area and determined that there were 88 OFW WIBIDs, that is water bodies or water body segments that were verified impaired for one pollutant or another. 46% of those were impaired for fecal indicator bacteria and 27% impaired for nutrients. Um, this was a concern to us, and uh, we're seeing this trend uh, continue in a way that uh, we're not seeing restoration uh, being uh, uh, brought forward to uh, remedy some of these impairment problems. Next slide. So also as a part of the letter, uh, the conference uh, made priorities uh, had in, in part of that communication to FDEP. These were the five estuaries that the uh, CHMP program had prioritized for uh, TMDL development and rest eventual restoration. They all had nutrients as their uh, uh, impairment parameter. And uh, of course, Matt O'Shea was right at the top. Also included Lemon Bay, Donna Bay, Roberts Bay, and Blackburn Bay. So I guess the question you, you may be asking is how many TMDLs were developed uh, as a result of this prioritization process uh, since about 2017? Some of these WIBIDs probably were verified impaired much before 2017. So they were out there um, requiring restoration at some point in time, probably even before 2017. Next slide. So as part of this discussion, we did have a workshop that year that FDEP came down for Aaron Rasnake and uh, Julie Espy. Uh, we learned a lot about what the options were for restoration. Uh, one of those uh, assessment potential uh, programs is called a categorical TMDL. And this is in a situation where if the particular WIBIT or water body did not rank high, uh, the department would consider con continue to consider it for TMDL development uh, where the stakeholders have petitioned for that process. And so I viewed that letter in 2010 as a petition uh, asking FDEP to prioritize that TMDL development for those five uh, estuaries as part of the program. The other possibility is a legislative priority. Uh, and if you recall the Kusanachi estuary uh, TMDL in 2009 came about as a result of a, a legislative priority stemming from local government uh, asking for that to happen. So there's a variety of ways TMDLs can be brought um, forward uh, in, in this process. Uh, and the uh, what we call alternate TMDLs, the 4B and 4E plans are a couple other examples. Next slide. So, Again, to kind of answer that question about what has happened in response to that request for TMDL development, I went to the uh, department's FDEP's uh, map indicating uh, TMDLs that have already been adopted. And you can see this, this is indicated by uh, the WIBIDs with a blue outline and not a lot of WIBIDs uh, where TMDLs have been adopted. In fact, I cannot find uh, a situation where a TMDL has been adopted since 2010. So we're looking at 11 year run without any TMDLs being adopted in the study area that I can determine. Next slide. So, you know, along this trajectory that we're seeing with more uh, impairments, verified impairments occurring through the state's uh, FDEP assessment program, uh, unfortunately, uh, Astero Bay 
uh, the state's first state aquatic preserve was verified and paired for nutrients in 2019. Uh, this followed um, considerable impairment designations for the tributaries to the bay. Um, you know, those OFW tributaries were designated OFW in 1990. So it's been 30 years uh, that they uh, should have been enjoying the most protection that the state can provide to prevent impairment. Unfortunately, that has not occurred. And now the bay is, we can add that to the list of verified impairments uh, within the CHMP study area. Next slide. So uh, as part of this concern that we have about this trajectory for increased impairment, we thought, well, let's take a look at the region as a whole. Um, and we look at uh, nine counties from Pinellas and Hillsborough to the north. These are mostly coastal counties down to Collier, trying to understand what the impairment situation, water quality impairment situation is in these nine counties and what are some of the potential factors or metrics that are driving impairment. Next slide. So really our ob objectives were, were pretty obvious. We wanted to look at impairment on more of a geopolitical basis, on a county basis. Um, and we did that through using the statewide comprehensive list of verified impairments for 2018, 19, and 20. Again, for nine South Missouri counties. And we, we thought our assessment was consistent and conservative because uh, we're only looking at verified impairments. We're not looking at anything on the study list. So this should be basically considered the tip of the iceberg in the context of uh, regional impairment on a county basis. And so we, we summarized and compared impairment trends where possible or appropriate for each of the nine counties. And we thought it, it was also good to look at these nine counties because they had a, var a variety of commonalities to each of them. They had similar meteorology uh, designated in zone four in the Harper uh, recommendation on stormwater management. So they had that in common. Most of these, except the two inland counties, Glades and Henry had urban land use, a significant element of the landscape. Uh, most had westerly flowing rivers terminating in a Gulf of Mexico estuary. And um, most of the counties uh, were encompassed by FDEP basin groups one through three, where their five year assessments had been adopted by 2018. So we're only looking at that period of record 2018, 19, 2020. And we had a somewhat of an abrupt uh, or a short period of record. And we did that for a reason. We wanted uh, the most consistent basis for comparing years and between counties. And we thought that, you know, we talked about some of the bacteria impairments changing, or should I say criteria changing in 2017. So that made it harder to compare years and harder to compare counties. But this period of record is more consistent. And we thought it enabled more comparability uh, between the nine counties. Next slide. So again, some of the study outcomes of our uh, water quality impairment summary, we thought were that, um, you know, using local governments is kind of the uh, common denominator for affecting restoration was, was probably relevant. Um, if you look at most of the B maps and the MS4 permitting programs, it's almost all local government. Uh, and other stakeholders, local stakeholders that are affecting restoration or hopefully prevention of impairment uh, as part of those programs. Understanding the factors or metrics that drive water quality decline specific to local governments uh, on the landscape will help prevent impairment or improve planning for restoration. And we thought this might be a good basis for tracking progress through time. Um, and it's, I think we, it would be easy to update this uh, document from time to time, and it provides a little bit more progress towards uh, restoration success, understanding it, what's driving success, and what accountability may be among stakeholders uh, as we move towards restoration. Next slide. So there are four components to the study. I'm just going to give you a quick snippet of uh, each one. Uh, this particular category was under county demographics and land use. 
And we were wanting to understand, again, what is driving impairment in, in these respective nine counties and um, you know, growth and, and development that results from population increase, we thought was a reasonable uh, metric for understanding what's driving impairment. Uh, and you can see some of the higher, uh, uh, faster growth counties here, uh, Lee and Collier, Manatee, Hillsborough to some degree, again, this 2018 to 2020. Um, as it turned out, after the 2020 census data was out, these turned out to be underestimates. Uh, these are from the uh, Beaver, University of Florida Beaver uh, estimates and for uh, current and future projections. And so we use that data, but um, so here we see Lee County leading the nine county uh, assemblage of counties is fastest growing uh, in the region. Keep that in mind as we talk about how impairment may connect to some of these uh, metrics. More recently, we've learned uh, that, uh, for example, Lee County is the fifth fastest growing county in the entire country. So we're seeing massive landscape conversion and growth as a result of these uh, population increases. And you could apply this to probably most of coastal uh, South Florida or even throughout the state. Next slide. And that was just a, a snippet. Second part was looking at elements. And again, this is just one example, elements contributing to water quality impairment uh, to our summary. Again, this is addressing that trajectory, we think towards increased impairment. Uh, this represents the percent change in total impairments within each of the counties, 2018 to 2020. And uh, you can see Collier and Lee pretty much uh, are significantly ahead of the other seven counties in terms of uh, increased uh, number of total impairments uh, since 2018. Next slide. We also wanted to look at other key metrics like uh, percent increase in developed area and percent increase in impervious area. Uh, we used for this these metrics data assembled by NOAA's Coastal Change Analysis Program, a very useful uh, and powerful uh, summary of information on a county resolution. Uh, if you haven't visited this site, you may want to. It does appear though that the data uh, ended in the year 2016. So we need some more current information to, to have a, a better or more relevant understanding of what's driving impairment. But again, you can see some of the faster growing counties, uh, Collier, Lee, Manatee, uh, Hillsboro, uh, leading the way in increasing in percent uh, uh, in development and increase in percent impervious cover. Um, if you remember from your watershed science training that once a basin reaches about 10% impervious cover, we begin to see a uh, definable decrease in water quality in urban streams. Uh, many of these basins have impervious cover that uh, is in that 30, 40% uh, impervious area. So presenting quite a number of challenges to reverse impairment in these kinds of basins. Next slide. As part of the second category of uh, metrics that we summarized, we also didn't want to give agriculture a pass. Um, so we looked at percent land area of each of these counties in agriculture as of 2016. And you can see the two inland counties, uh, Henry and Glades, uh, quite high and surprisingly Manatee. Uh, relatively high in percent area in agriculture. Uh, originally, when we started the study, we were only going to do the four counties in our project area, but we thought, well, let's look at a broader cross section of coastal counties and inland counties that are dominated by agriculture. Maybe that would give us some more insight into what's driving impairment. Um, and you can see Hendry has more than half the land area in agriculture, and Glades is also. Uh, high in that category as well. Next slide. Third component of the study was to look at annual percent change in water quality parameters per county. So we're looking at the four major categories of pollutant parameters, fecal bacteria in blue, nutrients in orange, metals in gray, uh, dissolved oxygen uh, in a yellowish color. And so in these counties, Collier and Glades, we can see that nutrient impairment is the most dominant form of 
of uh, water quality impairment. So that's that should be important to these uh, particular counties in terms of formulating restoration. You know, maybe we should be looking in these counties more towards uh, stormwater, better stormwater management uh, that might be a little different than we would approach a county that's mostly in agriculture uh, or where a county's high in fecal bacteria contamination. So there's differences. Next county. Oh, so next slide. So here's two examples of counties, Manatee and Hillsborough, that were dominated by fecal bacteria contamination as opposed to nutrients. So that presents a different picture in terms of what restoration obviously is needed and uh, how that might translate into policy changes uh, for local governments that would address this type of pollutant parameter. Next. So the final category uh, was we, we attempted to do a, a ranking process and I'm not exactly sure what motivated us to do this, but it, it did generate a, a quite a bit of interest in how these counties, how what the fallout was for impairment uh, in these nine counties. What we did is uh, if you look at these six metrics at the top, you know, these are mostly proportional metrics that are independent of county size or perhaps water area. And we ranked each of the nine counties uh, for each of these metrics. And then we averaged the ranks across the row for each county to come up with an average rank. So a rank of one would be a county that uh, ranks highest in trending towards impairment, you know, as opposed to a county that, uh, for example, that's been dominated by agriculture or a county that's built out in, and has attained a high level of impairment through time. Um, and it's really has nowhere to go in terms of uh, a trajectory towards increased impairment. So what we're really looking at here is what's trending more rapidly toward increasing impairment. And uh, I'm not gonna go into this too much. You can download our report. Uh, you can review this at your leisure. We footnoted and cited uh, all the databases that we use to uh, generate the ranking. So hopefully that'll be useful to you. Excellent. So in sum summary, real quick, um, one of the, the key takeaways I think was that urban population growth and associated development uh, certainly are a, a plausible uh, causality for impairment in most of these counties especially those that are growing rapidly. And to bring this home on a statewide basis, for example, uh, in 2010, uh, for fecal bacteria impairment, there were about a little over a thousand miles of streams and rivers in Florida that were verified impaired for fecal contamination. Jump 10 years as of 2020, that's increased by a factor of eight. So they're now over 8,000 miles of rivers and streams in the state that are verified impaired for fecal bacteria. So we're seeing a trajectory there that is, is pretty, very concerning. Uh, this not only creates risk for ecosystems, uh, but for public health as well. So we think that's an important um, metric to pay attention to. Won't go into these too much. If you look at some of these metrics like population increase, you know, the highest would be Lee followed by Manatee and Collier. Percent of total wivets impaired, or Glades at the top, Henry, then Lee, percent increase in developed area. And you can just read these, I won't, I won't go over them too much. Uh, the most frequently occurring impairment parameter in the six of the nine counties was fecal bacteria. Uh, nutrients represented the highest proportion of impaired wibbits in three counties, uh, that being Collier, Glades, and Hendry. And then you can see on this last bullet the rank of all nine counties from highest with Manatee uh, trending towards impairment uh, down through the, the remaining eight. Next slide. <clears throat> so again, just, just to try to bring this home in terms of where are we going with water quality decline? Uh, and I think it's clear to me that restoration is lagging behind a growing list of impairments and a growing rate of impairment statewide. Um, 
we're looking at groups like uh, CHNET that are doing a great job identifying projects to reduce uh, nutrient impairment. Uh, in, in many cases, providing funding for those kinds of things, but we're not seeing the state step up and develop TMDLs to make that happen. Uh, again, I can't, I can't really determine whether a TMDL has been developed uh, in the past 11 years. And uh, this was a case where uh, the conference actually petitioned FDEP to develop and prioritize TMDLs in the study area. Map shape pass and those other four estuaries that uh, I mentioned earlier. So we're not seeing the progress on those from the state's uh, engagement that we would like to see. Uh, another example, for example, Lee County has two B maps, and again, talking about the effectiveness of TMDLs and B maps. Uh, be careful what you wish for. Uh, the B maps are very controversial at this point in time. The legislature is looking at revising beam maps through the uh, Clean Waterways Act that passed last year. Um, it just seems like beam maps that base their, or measure their success based on projects or presumed compliance um, really are, are not addressing um, empirical or uh, actually measured uh, changes in water quality as they should. Um, <clears throat> So, for example, in Lee County, we see two B maps for nutrients. But Lee County had the highest rate of increase in nutrient impairment impaired wibbits since 2018. We saw a 36% increase in the number of wibbits verified impaired for nutrients in Lee County during that short period of time. So that's concerning. Um, and the other thing I think that should be of, of a concern to everybody is that the water body, the highest value water bodies that we are challenged with, those being outstanding Florida waters, have a, still a high proportion that are impaired and continue to increase. Uh, Estero Bay, again, being the most recent one in 2019. And we're seeing some fundamental changes and in, in for perhaps primary productivity in Mattachet Pass. We're seeing um, uh, very significant increases in macroalgae that are apparently outcompeting seagrass is one example seeing a pretty steep decline in seagrass distribution in the sterile bay as well. So the challenges are out there uh, that we need to address. Next slide. So potential remedies, we think uh, improved MS4 compliance. This is the uh, MPDS stormwater uh, permitting program through the state. We think this probably has the most potential for reversing uh, that trend. Uh, increased state and local funding for TMDL development is gonna be necessary for implementation of uh, subsequent VMAPs, and we think local governments and associated stakeholders really should take the lead on water quality restoration with assistance from state and regional funding sources and groups like CHNEP. So consider stakeholder-driven alternatives as well. And I do have one uh, perhaps uh, good note uh, to end the presentation on. Uh, we met with uh, FDEP yesterday and starting next year, they're going to start doing consolidated TMDLs for fecal bacteria as a pilot project in the Estero Bay watershed. It's gonna be interesting to see these come online um, and we hope that compliance and enforcement will parallel these new initiatives. I think that is it. To address questions if there are any or if there's time. Um, okay. Yes, we're opening for questions, so if you like to start. Yes, <laughs> John knows this of course. Is a thing near and dear to my heart that I've worked on many years of my life. Um, I think two things that are important for people to understand to kind of get some of the context of the policy here is number one, that OFWs, which are supposed to be protected against any degradation, often are not handled differently. If you look at actually the classification of designated use for those water bodies, they're typically classified as just typical class three or class two. There's not, there isn't a separate designated use classification for outstanding Florida waters in Florida, but there are in other states. So that's one thing um, that, you know, is an opportunity with the triennial review process where a state submits this to EPA and EPA then 
looks at, you know, how are water quality standards being implemented in Florida because Florida has been delegated authority under the Clean Water Act to implement this, that there could be a separate designated use for OFWs. The other issue, though, is that OFWs have to have monitoring at the time of their designation to establish what their baseline water quality was at the time of designation. And a lot of these older OFWs, unfortunately, did not have that. And what I just learned this past week is that even some newer OFWs, I was talking to someone in the panhandle who's working, who just recently got an OFW designated up there for an aquatic preserve. And they said, unfortunately, the monitoring was suspended the year that it was designated. So um, that becomes a, a problem because you really need the water quality exactly at the time of designation to establish what is that anti-degradation standard that you're gonna be measuring against in the future. And then the other thing um, that I think is important to understand is the process by which DEP um, determines where it's gonna prioritize TMDL development. In theory, TMDLs are required under the Clean Water Act and case law had established that they should be developed within five to seven years of the time they are determined to be impaired, verified impaired. Um, but because the list of verified impaired water bodies in Florida is so voluminous, um, DEP has limited staff and resources, so has been working on trying to address things in kind of a triage fashion with a prioritization scheme. And the prioritization scheme basically looks at the HUC units, which I think many of you are familiar with the USGS HUC units are quite large and all of like a lot of us, our area in Southwest Florida is in one giant HUC unit. And they basically look at by HUC unit, which ones are the worst. And our HUC unit has been missing that cutoff by a hair, which means that no impaired waters in the entire HUC unit get TMDLs. Um, so just if you were wondering why is this continually an issue since 2010 or whenever, the last TMDL has been developed in our region, it's because this prioritization method is um, not working in favor of us, like at least even getting some of these higher priority. And as John mentioned, I mean, 88 outstanding Florida water with it were impaired when we did that assessment in 2017. And we whittled that list down to like eight uh, that we asked for TMDLs for out of 88. You know, so we were trying to be pragmatic in giving what we thought were just the creme de la creme problematic impaired waters that everyone agreed that we do not believe these are anthropogenically impaired. You know, I mean, we do not believe that they are naturally impaired. There's some kind of anthropogenic driver. Um, so I think those things are important kind of in context to understand this presentation. Quick response, uh, OFW criteria is a priority criteria for the prioritization process, but apparently it wasn't enough as you suggested in this case to for DEP to develop a TMDL. The other thing is I asked recently how many uh, WIBIDs or water bodies have been on the state's 303D list or impaired waters list for eight years or longer and about 35% have been on the list for eight years or longer. The, the cutoff, I believe, used to be 13 years, but the consent decree expired last year for how long a Wibbit can, an impaired Wibbit can stay on the list without TMDL development. Now it's indefinite? It's that way, but this, what we learned yesterday is kind of good news that they are moving forward. Um, DEP is moving forward with fecal FIP uh, TMDLs uh, on a collective basis. So they're not doing it by wibbid by wibbid now. They're proposing to do it in a basin context. So hopefully you'll see uh, in the next biennial cycle, you'll see these apply to the CHNP group two basins. Well, the one thing that I think this group as a TAC needs to be aware of is that the state impaired waters rule um, got modified through the years where it used to be that if something was verified impaired, it stayed verified impaired until a TMDL was developed. Uh, it could not be delisted unless you could prove that the water quality had been restored to support its designated use. Unfortunately, now the opposite is the case where the burden of proof is that you have to continually prove through sufficient monitoring 
that it is verified impaired for it to stay on the verified impaired list or it becomes delisted for insufficient data. And one of the things you do see in looking at like the Conservancy of Southwest Florida's estuaries report card for Southwest Florida, which also assesses, you know, how many impaired waters and how many are um, essentially no longer impaired or are not impaired just for lack of data, not because they are truly clean and supporting their designated use, but because there's insufficient data to prove that they're verified impaired. That has grown the percentage of water bodies. What's the required like schedule for the sampling to be not delisted? How often? Oh, it's super complicated and varies by each parameter. But I mean, I think what has happened, and and I think this is important because you know a lot of this is a blend of science and policy, and you have to understand both to really make sense of it. But you know, we always think you know it is important, of course, to have quality assurance and quality control of data. Right, the the QAQC standards and the impaired waters rule have become incredibly stringent in cases where data that would have been admissible to EPA is not being admissible to the state and is not being utilized, and that becomes problematic when you go into the assessment because if you have insufficient data for assessment, then it defaults to unimpaired. So I just think all of that has to be thought about that. You know, we don't want perfection to be the enemy of the good when it comes to data collection. And we also need to understand how important it is that data be collected sufficiently and that it be all uploaded into WIN so that it is utilized in assessment. Because if, if we have data, and in some cases we do know some data is in our area is not right now being incorporated into WIN, you know, that could be critical data that makes the difference between something being properly assessed and not. So we definitely. That's why the study has so many insufficient data components to keep it from going to category five. So that's why we focused on just verified impairments, not the ambigu amb ambiguity of the study list that you really do need to look at the study list as well. Because many of those will probably be coming forward as category five. To answer Daniel's question, the state's gone from a staggered five year cycle for assessment and adoption to doing all the state's basins, all five basins every two years now. It's a biannual approach now, which is good. I think that's an improvement. Mm -hmm. It is. Hopefully, we'll see some more TMDLs come on. Well, the last thing I'd add is that TMDLs are, are you know, federally legally required under the Clean Water Act, BMAPs are not. So the way a, normally a TMDL is implemented is because at the time of the Clean Water Act, it was mostly focused on point source discharges. So it was supposed to be folded directly into point source discharge permits immediately upon the adoption of the TMDL. BMAPs, as we know, are important to address non-point source discharges, but those are actually optional and they are not legally required under the Clean Water Act. So I, uh, to, in that vein of don't let perfection be the enemy of the good, I know we have concerns with some of the BMAPs, but on the other hand, understand that even having a BMAP is actually a win um, because there's so many TMDL water bodies that don't even have BMAPs. And there are alternate things called reasonable assurance documents, but those don't provide the same legal enforceability that a BMAP does. And they also don't capture all the polluting stakeholders to come in and be participants in reducing that type of pollution, whereas a BMAP does. So just want to kind of, again, kind of spell out that BMAPs, we, we also want to see more of those. Well, the, the wild card in that from a local government perspective is Clean Water Act says maximum extent practical. And so what is that? And so that becomes a basis for certain interest groups to say, well, we're doing the maximum we think is practical. And so that, that becomes a little bit of a problem when we see impairment accelerating up to as high as we've seen it. Mm -hmm. I question earlier about, um, you were saying there's certain, we fall in a certain region for, and, and there's just not enough of the TMDLs or enough of the impaired water bodies for them to start acting in our region. Is that what you said? Maybe, John, you can explain the HUC prioritization. It's a 15 step prioritization process and it's, I, I don't 
understand the outcome of it in every case. All I know is that we're not getting TMDLs developed. And you should be asking FDP, you know, which HUCs got TMDLs. I have it on here. The planning for 2022 for the future TMDLs and everyone is pretty much around Lake O. It looks like there's like 15 of them and every one is around Okeechobee. So I, I think what you do, they pick a HUC unit to focus on. The yellow is the planned ones. And they're all right in this one little region. There's a, a resource issue here. And yes. staff many times, we just don't have the resources to implement the TMDL. It's part of why it's like. Yeah, I'm sorry to be so blunt here and to actually cut this wonderful conversation, but we need to move <laughs> on because I have another speakers coming up. Uh, but there is one question I want to put up in the in the presence of that the person, um, um, Mr. Mark Walton, he put is a R A A R A P an alternative? Could this mechanism be implemented faster? So let's just leave that question there for um, possible answers through the chat. Uh, 